Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we discussed the theory and mathematics of physically based rendering and we also looked at the results compared to the earlier renders that used funk shading. We are going to spend the rest of this episode on implementation of PBR, which is actually not a lot of code to write, but we'll also add a couple of new features to the engine in order to handle geometry components for game entities and their default materials. Before we start though, I'd like to let you know that moving forward, I'm going to do these videos in a new format. We've been working on this game engine for a little more than 4 years now, and although we've written a lot of code, there is still a lot more to cover before we have an engine that's capable of running a basic 3D game. And at the current speed, I'm afraid we won't reach that point before the end of this century. I've been looking into ways to speed up our progress, and I noticed that in the videos we are waiting for about half of the video's runtime for me to type the code. So I thought if I'd write the code beforehand and explain it in the videos, I can cover a lot more code, which hopefully allows us to move faster. I do realize that this is a big departure from the original format, but I think it's a fair trade in favor of our progress. I'll still show you all the code changes that I made since the previous video and hopefully you'll still be able to follow along. Obviously if you're a Patreon or Coffee supporter, you also have access to the code repository so you always have the codebase as a reference. Please do feel free to let me know what you think of the new format, either in the comments or in our Discord server, or any other channel you can find to get in touch with me. Don't come to my house though, I've installed anti-stalker tactical nuke missile turrets around the house. So anyway, let's see how much damage we can do in this video. Previously we changed the vertex format for encoding normal and tangent vectors, and in this video we are also going to fix how UV coordinates are imported from the FBX files. Therefore we need to re-import all assets in the scene. Although we can still use the untextured models, their normal vectors are no longer unpacked correctly and therefore I re-imported those as you see here. In addition I also added a sphere model using our own procedural geometry tool. Of course you can use any sphere model and import it. Here I simply created a sphere with 48 segments in either direction. I also made it smaller so it has a radius of half a meter. We can save this to an asset and open it in the geometry editor so that it's exported for testing. Here we can rename the saved asset to sphere underscore model, which I already did for all assets in the scene. Now let's look at the changes that I made to the code. In case you are not used to looking at the code differences in Visual Studio, the red lines denote code that has been removed or updated, and green lines mean that new code has been added. If a line of code is changed, you'll see how it was before the change marked in red and how it's now in green with the specific change marked in brighter green. It might need a bit of getting used to, but I hope it's still not that hard to follow. Ok, so let's start with a few bug fixes and the most important one was where we import UVs from FBX files. Although I couldn't find any official documentation on this, it appears that UV coordinates in FBX files always have their origin in the lower left, with the U axis pointing to the right and the V axis pointing up. But in DirectX, the UV origin is on the top left and therefore the V axis points down. That's why we flipped the V axis in our pixel shader, so the textures wouldn't render upside down. However, importing the UVs as they are in the FBX files also causes the tangent space to be calculated with the opposite handedness and that's why we also had to flip the sign of the tangent space. By reversing the V axis during import, we don't have to do either of these in shader anymore and as you can see here, we just take the UV from the vertex element and leave the handedness as is. There are obviously more changes in this shader file, but I'll come back and explain all of them later. The other bug fix that I did was when importing tangents from the FBX file instead of calculating them. First we call this SDK function that generates tangent data if the file doesn't contain tangent vectors. 
If the data is already there or it generated the data successfully, it should return true. However, I think due to an error, it returns false if the file already contains tangent data. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here, but I had to take it out of the if statement in order to make it work. In addition, we can only work with the unindexed tangent data, so we expect to have as many elements as there are indices. I also reversed the handedness here, since the tangent data is generated using the fbx's uv origin. Those are all changes in fbximporter.cpp. We also have a bug in geometry.cpp where the wrong condition was used. The tangents array should have as many elements as the indices array. I also renamed this function to get vertex element size and had to update it whenever it's called. Here, here, and here. In textureimporter.cpp, we were using this metadata variable in an assertion, which is only compiled in debug build. It was giving warnings in release, so I got rid of that local variable. Now in order to use physically based shading for all objects in the scene, we need some way of setting material properties even for materials that don't use textures, or at least not all types of textures. There are a few ways we can do this, and I think extending the per object data structure is a good way to pass the information. This is because it doesn't necessarily increase the memory usage, since constant buffer blocks are allocated in 256 byte chunks anyway, and we still have some room left to fill that in. So here I added all properties that we use in our materials. Although it doesn't make sense to include all of these, and I may come back one day and remove some of it. In renderer.h, I fixed my typo here, but more importantly, I added a new structure that will be part of the material block when we create a material. It's called material surface, which might not be the best name, but let's go with it for now. When we create a material, we can fill this structure in and pass it along with the initialization info. I also put this pointer up here. Please see this video where I explain and implement materials in Primal Engine. As I mentioned, we have to make this data part of the material block, which is created using the internal material stream class here. This also means that each material block will grow by 44 bytes, which might not be worth it, since most objects in a typical game use textures anyway. So again, this is something worth coming back to later in order to optimize it. We add the size of material surface to the buffer size to make room for material properties. Down here, we have a new pointer to material surface within the material block as well as the offset from the start of the block. So this pointer is just the address of the block plus this offset. Let me put this side by side so it's less cluttered. I removed some unnecessary parentheses and added this line. The address of shader IDs is now shifted accordingly. Then we have a getter function that returns the pointer to the new data. Finally, in the constructor, we have the new buffer size and we can write the information to the block in the same way as other data. Here I added an assertion in the getDescriptor indices function, which is unrelated. And down here, we can return the pointer to material surface when filling in a material cache, which I also updated to contain a new member, as we'll see next. In d3d12content.h, I added parameter names to these functions to make them more readable. And we have the new pointer to an array of material surfaces. Similar to other material data, we can cache material surfaces in the gpass cache. Here I added the new entry and when we get the pointers in the cache, we also return this new pointer. Of course, when creating or resizing the cache buffer, 
We should also account for the size of this extra pointer and set it as well. Because we need to include material surface in the per object data, we have to pass it to fill per object data function, where we use a simple memcopy to copy the data. Note that we pass the address of base color as the destination address in memcopy. The material cache is passed in prepare render frame function. And that's all we have to do to set default material properties for any object in the scene. Next, I added the geometry component for use with game entities. Until now, we only had transform and script components in our entity component system. Here, I added a new header file named geometryComponent.h, which contains the geometry namespace and the component class. It follows the same recipe as other components, but it doesn't really have anything the game code can interact with yet. In time, we'll decide what properties of the geometry we want to expose to the game code. Next, I'm adding the geometry component to the entity class. I fixed a typo in a file name and cleaned up the namespace notation. We see the geometry component accessor function here. And here we use F32 instead of float. I added the internal geometry component functions and the initialization information here. Again, it's similar to other components in that it has create and remove functions. We also have a function that fills in an array with the render item IDs of all geometry components. So as we see here, we pass the geometry and material IDs in the init info, and the create function will create a render item using this data, as we'll see in a bit. We also have the implementation and the internal data containers. For now, I just added an array for the active LOD and another one for render item IDs. I'm not entirely sure yet if the geometry component should be in charge of creating and removing render items, but let's go with this design for now. In addition, we are using double indexing here, like we did for the script component, in order to keep the arrays tightly packed without holes in them. Please see this video where I explain in detail how this is implemented, so I'm not going to explain it here again. Here we have a function that's only called in debug build to check if a component with this ID does exist. Accessing a component that doesn't exist or has been removed can only happen if there is a bug in the engine code and not because of an issue in the game script code written by the game programmer. So the shipping engine should not have this issue and can be used without this function, if that makes sense. When creating the geometry component, we do the usual ID generation stuff with the addition of double indexing. Then we proceed to using the initialization information to create a high-level render item. The active LOD always starts at the most detailed LOD, which is zero. At the end, we return the component with its ID. When removing the component, the render item is removed first, and then we swap the entry that's going to be removed with the last element in each array and update the mapping indices. This last part pushes the ID for reuse into an array of three IDs. Please watch this video where generational IDs are explained. However, there is this new condition that I added where we check if the generation of an ID is about to wrap around, and in that case, we retire that ID and never use it again. This totally gets rid of the wraparound problem that can happen, which I initially didn't solve since it's very, very unlikely to happen. But this solution, which was proposed by Daniel Rotnamer, one of the viewers of this channel, is a simple and elegant way of dealing with the unlikely occurrence of that issue. So I added this new constant in id.h, where I also set the generation bit back to 8. Apparently we have been using 10-bit generations all this time and we didn't even notice. And here we can use it to determine if we should push an ID or not, which is almost always yes, unless the generation is about to wrap around, which as I said is rather unlikely. 
Okay, now in order to create an entity with the geometry component, we have to expand the entity info to include geometry in it info. And we must not forget to forward declare it here as well. And finally, we have to create the component when we create a game entity. Therefore, in entity.cpp, we have a new array to hold geometry components and, well, I'm not going to mention every tiny code cleanup, but I'll just mark them in the videos like this so it helps you to notice them as well. Here we make room for the array and we create a geometry component if we have a pointer to geometry init info. Conversely, we remove the component when the entity is being removed. And we do the generation check here as well. Here I collapsed some lines of code and implemented the geometry component getter function at the end. While we are looking at components, I also made some little changes to the script component where we have the same debug function to check if it exists and added the generation check here as well. Oh, by the way, originally this part was entirely missing since I apparently forgot to push back free IDs. Luckily, it was reported as an issue on GitHub by Code Goggles. I can see that your Code Goggles work excellent for picking up details that I missed. And there is another one which I fixed, so I can show it as well. Here I was comparing two floating point values directly, which is obviously not the right way of doing it, due to floating point imprecision. We must use this extension method instead. And I also made tangent calculation the default when importing geometry. So these are both fixed now. Thanks for reporting the issues. Okay, going back to script.cpp, that's all I did here, plus some minor changes. That's pretty much all changes for components, and I think this is a good spot to stop. Because in the next video, we are going to use the geometry component for adding meshes to the scene, and we'll also pass the default PBR material properties. Then I'm going to show you how the cooktorrents brdf function is implemented in the pixel shader. Hopefully you still enjoyed watching the video in the new format. I'm sure there is a bit of getting used to, but I'm confident it will work out. Again, I'm always open to suggestions to improve the videos, so feel free to leave a comment or reach out in the Game Engine series Discord server. As always, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.